Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Finlay, for that very warm welcome and kind introduction. Particularly appreciate references to dad. Dad was my first teacher, first principal. Then I got to go home and have dinner with him. <laughs> and Madam Grise, I want to thank you for being invited to, um, to participate in, in this symposium. And I want to join you and the Royal Society in Atakshitsi Hatlatwe Hiksu Treaty 7, Ma Chanapsik, Ma Tikitsu, Sityaksa Inchat, Histakshit Ahoset, Nu Chanotlat Lakishbit Maaz. As is the way of our peoples and was rightfully done here today, we acknowledge as we acknowledge the laws established by the ancient Greeks that we too here are amongst the Treaty 7 nations who have their own laws. And we begin with the acknowledgement that somebody else's laws apply here in Treaty 7 territory. I come from the House of Tlakishbit, as I said in my language, I carry the name A Inchat. And it means everyone depends on you. No pressure, guys, <laughs> whatsoever. And uh, my, my village is that of the Nuchanoth people, the language that I speak. And I think many in this room would know that uh, there are many languages, many indigenous languages across Canada. And in my language, acknowledging the, the Treaty 7 peoples and explaining where I come from, because that's where we begin with. We begin with seeing one another, with recognizing one another. And I'm so very thankful that you've invited me here in my role as National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. And I, in turn, am inspired as well to recognize the students who are here from the schools and I want to recognize you because so often as young people, you're told, you're the leaders of tomorrow. You're our leaders of the future. Well, I want the Royal Society, those who are here today gathered in person and those online, to know that these young people were recognized in turn by their own schools. They're here because of demonstrating excellence, because they are fully engaged in their learning, and they're demonstrating that they will find their full potential so join me in acknowledging the students from the schools who are here from Treaty 7 territories. I am so encouraged and excited, in fact, by the thoughtfulness of, of this agenda and what it is that the Royal Society has contemplated and, uh, and also appreciate... Uh, my friend and executive director and running partner uh, and recent new father, Darren Gilmore, uh, your important work and supporting your, your executive leadership in the Royal Society. Uh, it's no small task to take uh, on uh, the obligations to help support an organization that's been around since 1882, just a couple years since the Royal Society was forged with the objectives that were articulated here to promote, recognize, and advise. And for my part, I would like to hopefully make a small contribution only to help spur on some of the d discussion that will occur. And I'm so impressed with the lineup of contributors that you've invited to be here. We have leaders from uh, the student leader movement. We have important uh, contributors to social change right now. And I do feel that we are in a moment, as it were, not, not necessarily characterized by this day or this week or even this last year of uh, idle no more rallies and events. We are indeed in a major moment. I believe one of significant transformation. It's not one that is isolated to this part of Canada or, or this country alone. We are in a moment of Indigenous peoples both here in Canada and around the world, um, taking our rightful place, beginning to rebuild our communities and our nations, beginning to reconnect with our very identities so that we have somebody here with a wonderful Scottish accent, I'm guessing, who is uh, in a Canadian university reflecting the colonial history of the very building we're in, <laughs> tells us that the recognition is becoming something that is internal and conscious. And, uh, and I really appreciated those quotes and I thought, how could I, since those quotes were taken, how could I then match or contribute to quotes? And I, I, I could only come up with one. And it is this. Fear is the path to the dark side. 
Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Yes, that was Yoda of Star Wars fame. <laughs> and so we have our contemporary reflections back through, through mass and modern media and ways of, of thinking about our world that uh, is very much changing in, uh, rapidly in, in recent decades and recent years. I think of the changes since the 1880s to this moment. The reflections already made that I would uh, also like to uh, take a moment to, to reflect back on. So much about uh, promoting understanding and reaching across divides that have grown, perhaps not of our own doing, but that the Royal Society is embracing uh, this moment to engage deeply and directly. And for that, I'm so very thankful. As was mentioned, uh, my father has authored a couple of books. Uh, in our language, talking about that sense of oneness, that sense of interconnectedness and that being one of between peoples, between human beings, but also extending to the environment, the living world around us. The idea that all things are living, in fact. Even the stones, I would be told as a kid. Even those rocks are alive, we would be told as kids. And as such, should be respected. E sock stuff, respecting each other. And be recognized. And be included. And so I'm very, very thankful that uh, we have this recognition and inclusion happening here and reflection back on the divisions that have emerged, the new struggles that our elders are finding themselves in, talking to the youth that uh, about the flooding that happened. I was in Calgary when the flooding started to occur and was to be at events and ended up visiting the communities in Treaty 7 territories and hearing you young people say, when I asked, how is it going? We're, we're rebuilding the homes of the elders in our communities, that idea of the rebuilding the homes of community members, right, the, is starting to happen. And the rebuilding of lives and the volunteerism that the young people exhibited, but also the reflection that it wasn't just Treaty 7 First Nations, but it was people from surrounding areas that were also coming as well. What's possible in moments of crisis, the likes of which is happening in the Philippines and other moments when we see the needs of, of humanity and people reaching out, people in need, how deeply we feel that sense of unity, that sense of oneness, that sense of connection, and how divisions seem to just melt away, where we just want to help one another. We're gathered here to talk about some of these new struggles, and we're facing prospects of a poor quality of life than perhaps our parents' generation more broadly, including access to secure full-time jobs and access to a healthy environment. These are fundamental questions of social justice. From a First Nations perspective, these issues are particularly pressing, and in many ways, they're issues that Indigenous peoples have been facing for a long, long time. We are, as First Nations, the fastest growing segment to the Canadian population. This, by now, many of you know. Growing at a rate over 25% compared to 6% for the general population, over half of our population is under the age of 25. So, you students... You are absolutely the power base of Indigenous peoples in this country. As was exhibited when I marched with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis youth, the division seemed to just melt away. As it was the young people saying to the adults, we got to find a way to overcome divisions that we didn't create. On and off reserve, status and non-status. Those grew, grew up with the grandparents out on the land, speaking their language fluently, and those who didn't have that opportunity to experience uh, such connections with their culture, with their teachings, and with their treaties. And this is the reason why I keep upholding and recognizing the Indigenous youth voice as being so critical at this juncture. One of the fundamental precepts of Indigenous worldview is that all voices must not only be listened to and heard, but most importantly, understood. And we're seeing, we're seeing this uh, tremendous uh, outpouring and involvement and leadership amongst you as First Nations young people that inspires me every single day. We're also seeing young people step forward in, in leadership roles, the likes of which uh, in many cases are new and first, the University of Saskatchewan, if I'm not mistaken, the very first Indigenous president of the Student Council Union is here today, Max Feinde. What's up? <laughs> Congratulations. No small feat. No small feat. You see, we have an incredible number of firsts that are beginning to occur. My father didn't just uh, write those books. He, he went and he fought hard to achieve three university degrees. And I know that in other parts of the, 
the country we would call education as the elders do, the new buffalo. Back home, we have no buffalo. Never had buffalo. We're whale hunters. And my father still talks about his three degrees that he obtained from the University of British Columbia. Very oftentimes with a ferocity that said to the university, don't give me a gentle test on the thesis. Give me your toughest. Demonstrating that we as Indigenous peoples have the potential absolutely to accomplish anything we set our mind and our heart to. The opportunity to engage in and demonstrate genius for sure but also, of course, the potential for foolishness. Why? Because we're human beings. And we only need look to our stories that each of us have in our various languages to understand the kinds of encouragements about success in life, to know that uh, we have all the facets of, of being human beings within us as Indigenous peoples. Now is a moment where these struggles that we've seen, people like my dad and, and his generation, he went to residential school, the eldest of 17, in, in his family, his, his late mom bore 15 children, all went to residential school. Thinking about my late grandmother's day, she couldn't go past grade eight. So when I'm sitting here with you students in grade nine and grade 10, knowing that you're here being recognized for your attendance, it's the late grandparents that we all come from, that we honor and uphold. And that's what you do by being prepared to engage and not get in your own way to find a path to success and find a way to nurture that, uh, that talent, that passion, that skill that you have and stay anchored in your identity as Indigenous peoples. Grab that, grab that language that for some at the age of six in the memory of people like my dad, they watched kids having their tongues pricked when they tried to speak the only language they knew and went to school how to speak. We honour that memory and the resilience of, of those who went before us, the older generation, you see, this is where I'm trying to join you as being the age in grade nine and grade 10. I'm 46, so I'm a little older now, but I'm making efforts to be younger now in this moment because I want to honor those who've come before us. And so at this moment, Royal Society, patrons, it is about, as you've said in, in the setup to this conversation, it is about what's the global context you've asked me to reflect back on. And my father would remind me in this moment that first we have to understand together, better together, what was as a way to be clear about what our cur current reality is, what is, as a way then to decide and define together what's possible. And this is the moment I feel that we're in, the broad moment. I believe that it begins with breaking some of the patterns of uh, disconnect that we've got, breaking the patterns of, uh, of division that we've experienced. And I believe that understanding between and amongst groups is essential foundation through which we can drive solutions. I've, I've alluded to a few of them. You see, we've, we've got uh, 600 and over 630 First Nations under the Indian Act, but we've got over 50 Indigenous languages from coast to coast to coast. People often say, you guys are so complex and, and difficult to deal with. Can't you just all be the same? Well, we are very much drawn together by a shared experience of, of colonization, of residential schools, of disconnection from our land and our territories. But as I've just reflected, we are very diverse. And we inhabit every corner of what is now called Canada. And we've had so many divisions thrust towards us that we did not choose, like having children removed from their families, like my dad was as the eldest of 17 from his late mom when he was just little sent away to school for 12 years, probably being the best worst example of the kinds of externally thrust divisions within and amongst our peoples. So you see, there is an effort to reconnect happening even amongst us as Indigenous peoples. So we ask for your openness to understand this dynamic that's going on and, and your understanding that this is also about Indigenous peoples and the nation states like Canada uh, that we co cohabitate with you and that it's not just this country but countries around the world. So in fact, we then refer to this as a decolonizing effort. Decolonizing our past is our work today. Building understanding is the path to a brighter future. I've talked about my village of Ahouset, where we, where we come from, on the west side of Vancouver Island. I've talked a little bit about Hishuk Yishitsawak, the orienting worldview of Ahouset, the idea that everything is one and everything is connected. And I would submit 
with the support of my father and him passing on what he was told by his grandparents, that this indigenous worldview, he shook walk of interconnectedness, of wanting to find a way to achieve peace and harmony and balance, to return to a sense of balance between people and between people in the living environment, is in fact an indigenous vision that's emerging right now around the world. And perhaps in the in the reflection of the idle no more and the feelings of disconnect and issues of climate change. Is it real? Is it not? Is it happening? Is it not? My late grandfather made it abundantly clear over 40 years ago when I was out on the fish boat, he told me about the changing and warming climate. He didn't need Al Gore to tell him in the inconvenient truth. Our people know it's that deep and intimate connection with the land, but also the instructions from generations amongst our people. Our people know. And so we as Indigenous peoples not only have something to offer, we will offer it. And what we're suggesting that now is the time that we come together. We do so perhaps based on the work that our collective ancestors did. We don't need to look further than the treaty work that was already alluded to. Important treaties were forged right across this country that are unique in in essence around the world. As Justice Lyndon famously noted in the Ipperwash Inquiry, we are all treaty people. So in fact, if you are from one of the local First Nations that come from Treaty 7, but you are perhaps not from one of those communities and you reside in their territory, what Justice Lyndon is saying and what Indigenous peoples would concur with, whether you've arrived here as a landed immigrant or your family has been here 10 generations, you too are a treaty person. And as such, we inherit then a shared obligation to put into place the principles of the treaty relationship. And this is something that that we reflected on recently when I traveled to London. And the reason why I was just guessing about the Scottish accent was I was in London and uh, in Edinburgh. It's interesting that the University of Edinburgh has a Canadian studies program. It's a little eerie, actually, to go over there and have them thinking about Canada the way that they are so actively. But I was there because October 7th of 2013 was the 250th anniversary of the Royal Proclamation. This is an important moment that just that just arrived at. The Royal Proclamation is important because it was the first formal recognition that we as Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination, that we have land rights, that we had military alliances that were that were absolutely recognized and critical um, at the time, and that we have a right to share in in the economy um, of the lands. And I note even in your program one of these important reflections about that principle. That even in areas where there are not treaties, such as where I come from on the West Coast, in your program, you'll see uh, under the speaker section, it looks like it's under way underneath my picture there. It says that back in 1910, the chiefs of the Shuswap, Okanagan tribes and others said, some of our chiefs said, these people wish to be partners with us in our country. We must therefore be the same as brothers to them and live as one family. We will share equally in everything, half and half. A eh? 50-50, that's what it said. I got a, I got a head, I got a head nod down here. 50-50. In land, water, and timber, and so on. What is ours will be theirs, and what is theirs will be ours. We will help each other to be great and good. We can think about other major social justice movements around the world. We had the, the daughter of the late Martin Luther King speak at a rally in Vancouver. And this was 50 years after her late dad spoke in the march in Washington in front of 250,000 people, thinking, again, back to the quote by Yoda about fear, about fear of the other, about misunderstandings between peoples. And it was an incredible moment because she was speaking to a group that represented over 70,000 people who were walking in unity and in support of residential school survivors in 2013. This is the sort of example that suggests we are in a, in a major moment. And she was reflecting back to Canada, saying, talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that is beginning to unpack and reflect this history that goes back 250 years, a project, in fact, that we're still working on. And so I know that the number of speakers will reflect on other aspects of social justice and inequality, but we can also learn from the parallels and the similarities and some of the differences between the women's rights movements and the barrios and the big cities of Brazil, indigenous women that were pushed out of their homelands who were pushing for clean drinking water and proper sewage while many of the men went off to work in the factories. 
or the civil rights movement in the United States and the work of late Dr. Martin Luther King. And I sat down with his son, call him MLK3, Martin Luther King III. And so as young, as younger people, we, we think back to the time of our, our parents and our grandparents and the incredible moment in the work. And the time of the wampum belt of 1613, still one of the most vivid and important examples. It's now 400 years old, records the treaty between the Iroquois and the Dutch, the idea of a canoe of European and a canoe of First Nations side by side. These earliest treaties, of which there are hundreds across the country, were, were about a relationship between First Nations and the Crown. And now, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, now adopted by Canada and uh, countries around the world, reminds Canada and Canadians by extension that Canada is a successor state with the obligation to implement the treaty relationship based on an understanding of the Indigenous peoples of the lands. This is our work. This is the work that can provide the framework, the orientation, if you will, for a conversation about over, overcoming issues such as, such as inequality, overcoming the, the challenges that so many of our families are faced with right now to meet basic standards of life. And we're long overdue for this meaningful transformation in the relationship. And as was said, I firmly believe, and it's a apple doesn't fall far from the tree, education. Education, education is absolutely the key. Like I said, my dad was the teacher. I forgot to mention, mom was the substitute teacher. There was no getting away from education. And it was only 40 years ago when we were in the central coast of BC. And think about this for a moment. This is not decades. This is not generations ago. This is within my lifetime. A superintendent of schools said, by extension, a message to my dad, don't bother going back to a house that they're killing each other off. They won't even exist in 20 years. That's my village. There were about 250 of us then. We're now 2,000 strong. We don't have one. We have two schools. Dad graduated the first group of grade seven students. Dad went on to become the first First Nations man to accomplish a PhD at the University of British Columbia. You see, Max, right? We're on the comeback trail, right? I mean, it's a long journey, and the road is difficult. But the reason why I always hold up the young people, because I know they're overcoming odds, the likes of which so many don't have to face. Their parents have overcome odds to get to the place where they are. Their grandparents have overcome incredible odds. And this is a time now when young people, the country is beginning to see you. And the Royal Society is joining the effort, saying we want to be a part of finding a path forward. This is why I can't help but feel so excited about this moment. There was a time not that long ago when the Indian Act said that we couldn't organize. Well, I don't know more. We are able to organize. It's pretty organic. It's pretty grassroots. It sometimes feels uncomfortable. Leaders, including like me, get challenged. This is exactly what we must welcome. There has to be an uncomfortableness to breaking a status quo that is not serving anybody in First Nations or in this country. I come from a, a line of hereditary leadership that goes back, we can count, 27 generations. I as well, when I first engaged in this work, did not recognize the Indian Act's system at all. I saw it as an extension of the federal government. We ended up signing a protocol between our two systems. Why? Because to not acknowledge your reality will result in sickness and in, in harming ourselves. And so we instead confront the reality which is how I end up, end up finding myself doing this job instead of being a chef, which was my real ambition that maybe one day I'll return to, being a cook and an, and an entrepreneur. We have had, with the Assembly of First Nations for over 30 years, going on 40 now, a focus on Indian control of Indian education. In my first national meeting in 09, we stood up behind the youth leadership, who then stood in front of then-Minister Chuck Straw and said, we have a call to action on education. And probably my first act was to be in a local community in Quebec where we were marching out on the road in support of education. And we've seen this call taken up right across the entire country, led by and large also with young people. Last November, the federal government reported to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child that First Nations students living on reserve, attending both First Nations and provincial schools, had a national graduation rate of 33%, a rate that is virtually unchanged from the early 90s. We have a higher incarceration rate than a graduation rate. So, I'm watching you guys. Finish your school. Stay on that track. 
Make the struggles of those who dug the trenches that came before you. Stand in the, in the standards of, of the nations that you've come from. You can absolutely accomplish this. We remember that in the 60s and the 70s, we only had a handful of Indigenous people in post-secondary. We have tens of thousands of graduates now. We have 300, we have 300 medical doctors. We only had a K-12 to graduation rate about 14% in the early 70s. So 33% does not sound great at all. This is where we recognize that we're making progress on the long journey, but we're reaching out to Canadians to say we can do much better. We have had a 2% cap on annual increases on First Nations funding, including education, right? Paul, you were saying we need more funding for education. This came from a grade 12 student in this room right here while we're backing you up and saying we're calling on Canada and we're asking Canadians to join us. And we're saying to Canadians, the economic benefits when you finish will contribute. When we close the education and employment gap, over $400 billion to the Canadian economy and save over $100 billion in, expend in government expenditures were we to accomplish this, this effort. And we will accomplish it. So education is shifted, I think, more broadly to being just creating human capital for a market economy, but actors in a more civil society. And I, I also want to recognize a, a friend and a colleague, uh, Dr. Ralph Nielsen. He's the one that invited me to, to be chancellor at Vancouver Island University because I was challenging the universities, just like Paul Davidson, the president of the uh, University Association of Canada, is here as well. And of course, they turned this challenge right back on me and said, okay, Atlio, well, then you've got to be chancellor at VIU. So please stand up and be acknowledged. Thank you for inviting me to be chancellor of Vancouver Island University. Dr. Ralph Nielsen, president. I wanted to uh, just, just recognize that uh, we have so many actors out there. I think about late Shannon Kustach, and maybe some of you heard her story from Attawapiskat. She was in grade eight, and she tragically passed on, but she is famous for petitioning then Minister of Indian Affairs, saying, you know what? I deserve a school. I deserve a good school. We need 60 schools right now in First Nations communities across the country. Or what about the Nishiu Walkers? who walked from the northern shores of James Bay over 1,600 kilometers by foot to Ottawa. This is what I mean when I say not the leaders of tomorrow, but the leaders of right now. My role as national chief, to be clear, I am not the Indian prime minister. <laughs> I do not have the responsibility to decide for the over 600 First Nations and 50-plus languages. It is their responsibility. They are the holders of treaty and title and rights, my role is to support and advocate for change and to support First Nations to achieve their full potential. When we understand the overarching themes, the global context, then we can begin, as is your task over the course of this conference, to start moving towards specific plans of action, programs for change, and tasks for each and every one of us. I'm reminded, and we must be reminded by efforts to have these discussions in the past, Prime Minister Trudeau, I'm not projecting anything here about anything current, by the way. When he left office in 1978, he acknowledged with some frustration and regret, and he said, despite our attempts, the Indian problem is still with us. The massive five-volume report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples from 96 recounts these same challenges. And don't ever forget, we don't, that that report and that effort was born out of a conflict at the time, around land, as it's sometimes referred to, Oka, the Mohawk people standing up for their land rights. And so we think back to that moment, and I think back to my moments with Elsie Buktuk First Nation on the Atlantic coast, standing up for that, their land rights as well. And so we still have these patterns of conflict, and we've got reams of reports, the likes of which I'd be eight feet tall if I stood on all of them, that have reflected back the challenges and offered up ideas, in fact, many, many solutions for many, many decades now. And so what we do need is we need to agree that now is the time for a new story. We've had governments of all political stripes that have been challenged by um, the need for this new story. A story that includes proud nations celebrating strong voice of belonging and citizenship through their knowledge, languages, traditions, and respect, and recognition of the environment, economics, and governance systems. Canada, is more than two founding nations. It's more than a multicultural mosaic. It's more than a nation of immigrants. It's a country built on a heritage of strong, vibrant indigenous nations 
and on a fundamental foundation of partnership as expressed in treaties and the Royal Proclamation, the Canadian Constitution, and now the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We must also ensure as a fundamental aspect of social justice that First Nations can maintain these relationships, fulfill responsibilities, and engage in opportunities in relation to their lands and traditional territories, to their rights and title and treaties. Our new story embraces the understanding of our collective ancestors. We're called to be active participants in achieving our promise of respect, reconciliation, and sharing the promise of treaty and the promise among all of us, Indigenous settlers and newcomers. As I said in my language, we are all one and connected. Recognition and reconciliation requires that we see one another that we dialogue and understand one another with humility and respect. I talked about my late grandmother, and as I conclude, I want to think about the words that she shared with me. I stood with her and walked into the House of Commons and sat holding her hand in 2008 when the Prime Minister offered up the apology to her as a residential school survivor, her family, and all residential school survivors. And she said to me, trembling a little bit, Grandson, they are just beginning to see us. They are just beginning to see us. She was 87 years old at the time. She had also many times said to me to make sure that, Grandson, we no longer fight our fight with our fists any longer. We fight our fight with education. That was the kind of leadership that she and I see so many elders playing that despite the incredible amount that she and others have had to overcome in their lifetimes, what they've witnessed and what they've felt firsthand, the depth of their resilience, power, strength, grace, beauty, and kindness, and love, and love, the idea that we love one another more than just see one another, more than just respect one another, that we embrace each other's humanity is just so incredible. And so powerful, I can feel her presence even as I stand sharing these thoughts with you here today. And I know many of you from Indigenous backgrounds and other cultures may have similar ways of viewing the world and your relationship with those that have gone on before. So now it's up to us. It's up to do, us to do our part and to bring our voice as the next generation, picking up on that which we've learned from, from those who've come before us, to be active participants in writing this story. So it's inspiring to see the Royal Society of Canada stepping forward today with your own plan of action, creating a new social contract, and I want to encourage, perhaps in some ways, challenge the Royal Society to take it a step further, if you will, and recognize Indigenous knowledge and worldviews through a First Nations traditional knowledge holder fellowship. Join me in, a, in encouraging the Royal Society to do just such an act. I believe firmly that we must continue to see one another, as my late granny said was beginning to happen, to have institutions such, a, such as yours holding a mirror that reflects this new path forward, that we work together to achieve true social change, this especially for the kids. Together we can change the world, not just within our lifetime. We can change, create change that's needed right now for a better day tomorrow. Our time is right now. Now, Chu Tleko Tleko, thank you so much for the privilege of addressing me. Thank you so much, Sean. That was for events like this to get off to a good beginning requires two things. It requires an inspiring intervention such as we've just had, and then it requires the performance of engagement. As Chief Atlio said, there will be many authors to this new story. This is not a single authored colonial narrative. This is something that will take us forward. So please identify yourself and make some comments or direct some questions to the chief. Who wants to begin? Behold the turtle, he moves forward when he sticks his neck out. Stick your neck out and ask the first question. 
Hi, thank you so much. Very inspiring talk. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if we're supposed to introduce ourselves. I'm, I'm Rita Roy. I'm from the University of Calgary. Um, so I'm not an Aboriginal person, but I do consider myself an ally to your peoples. And my question to you is actually just about media representation of Indigenous peoples, which hasn't been very kind overall. Um, and certainly the Idle No More coverage hasn't always been very kind. And even with the residential school coverage, it's, it's often framed as something in the past. We don't hear about the historical trauma as much in the, in the media. So my question then is for the Aboriginal peoples and also those of us who are allies to your communities, what can we do to, um, to bring about that change in the media um, conversations so that there can be more understanding at the, at the sort of mainstream level about indigenous, indigenous issues? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I think about the the number of participants that are here. I think about the Tashas. I don't know where you're sitting at the moment, uh, Tasha. And I think about uh, um, indigenous uh, leadership, not just in media, uh, in academics. I think about the role of the student unions, um, the role of education more broadly. Canadians have not been supported to understand that which I've just reflected very ever so briefly. Uh, one thing that, that we would like to see is mandatory um, instruction on the issue of treaties and this, the, the truth of this history in every single school across this country so that when our children leave those schools that we accomplish what Treaty 3 says. And it's very explicit in Treaty 3. It says, you provide me the opportunity that I might teach your children about who I am, about the way I see the world, and I want to be able to do the same for, for your children that we might understand one another. Do you see how we've ended up at a moment where we have a forum, where we're, we're, we're seeking it, striving to understand when the original treaties were that we should be doing this work all along? So we can absolutely do this. There are, there are um, jurisdictions like Saskatchewan, if I'm not mistaken, Sagage, that Max, that have mandatory instruction right in the school system. So when I speak about education, it's not just about First Nations education. The fact that we got a two to seven thousand dollar less per expenditure per child, or we need sixty schools, or that funding for languages is not there when languages were 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 uh, when efforts were made to take away language. This is also about supporting all Canadians to understand the implications of being a treaty person, even if you're not from the First Nations in the treaty area where you reside, and that way uh, we enhance uh, learning and understanding. We see more Indigenous leadership in the media. And absolutely, I think media, they ask me questions, I ask them questions. And I think, I think it's fair that we encourage uh, media to dig deeper. Uh, and they have been. I, you know, to be fair, there's a number of media that are now spending more time speaking with Indigenous peoples, hearing their voices, uh, the full spectrum of voices across uh, um, such, you know, such a wide, uh, diverse number of voices that, that, is, uh, um, that is the reality of Indigenous peoples. We're seeing Indigenous authors now. My dad's two books on really are about Indigenous philosophy. John Ralston Saul in his book, Truths About Canada, Fair Country, reflected back, um, I think, uh, some important, he provided some important reflections for Canada as a thought leader that maybe not everyone agrees with. Uh, but what he said is, uh, he also said there's a missing conversation between First Nations and new immigrants. And so this is why the Royal Society is demonstrating uh, the work that's required. But in all facets of, of society, I believe that we need a bold, transformative lurch forward. The idea that somehow we can punt this work to future generations means we're selling the young people who are in this very room short. Now is the time we gravitate to them. We support them and make sure that they know that they're seen, that they're cared for, but we want to challenge them also to step into this opportunity and accept the responsibility that the ancestors have placed on, on each of them, that they can and will succeed and take us to the next level. So I think it's a multifaceted uh, response, but I always come back to education because it helps close the, the, the gap of misunderstanding. And we need dialogue to ensure that we, uh, we do achieve a much better shared understanding. Uh, I'm not sure if that uh, helps. I, you know what? I would encourage Tasha and others are going to have much more, much more pointed reflections back on this that, that I would be happy to hear about as well. Well, I want to just add just one quick note. And this is about the role of civil society and non-government organizations. Um, Canada is known as a human rights champion around the world. Clean drinking water in, in South America, building schools in Kenya. Those same international organizations are now working in Canada. Free the children. I've spoken to 16,000 change leaders in We Day events in 
Vancouver, in, in Saskatoon. And these are children who arrive knowing 80% plus, I think, is, is the number that engage in, in We Days with Free the Children, a major non, non-government organization, were asked specifically if they would support um, Aboriginal or First Nations issues going forward. These are, these are young people in grades six, seven, eight, nine, et cetera, elementary school kids too. So you see the youth are going to help lead the change as well. That's why the education piece is so important. When they go on and graduate and get into law school and end up on the Supreme Court, where they're hearing the Chilcotin case, who are one of the communities that are adjacent to the one that went in 1910. What's in your, what's in your materials? They, they were there in 1910 petitioning for their land rights to be respected. Those same people are now in the Supreme Court this week on a major, major title case. It's called the Chilcotin case. The Honey Guatin, the Williams case, is before this country because this country still has a fundamental precept or foundation of non-recognition. I've had that perspective given to me in court when we were fighting on, on fish, on the issue of commercial fisheries, which, by the way, we won. Give it up, <laughs> give it up. But the Crown came, the Crown lawyer representing Canada came and looked me in the eye and said, you as a peoples do not exist. We still have that fundamental structural relationship of non-recognition. This is why the Royal Society's recognition is important, because 250 years after the Royal Proclamation, we're still struggling to achieve formal recognition. Yes, good morning. My name is Rhoda Howard Hassam, and I'm a scholar of human rights and uh, genocide. Um, I believe you and Bernie Farber issued a statement recently saying that Canada's treatment of uh, Indigenous peoples was genocide. And I'm wondering what positive effect you think would come from that if the government were to agree with you. Well, it wasn't me that issued that statement. Uh, former National Chief Phil Fontaine. I, I beg your pardon. Yeah, um, That's okay. Uh, no, no apologies at all. Um, I really was honored to work with former National Chief, uh, particularly as he was one of the first... Uh, in a very public way, to talk about the abuse that he endured during the residential school um, experience. And it resulted in the biggest class action settlement, people think, around the world on Indian residential schools. And it led to the apology that I referenced with, uh, with my late grandmother. Um, I think it's important from the perspective of the debate that, that, it, uh, that it conjures, the debate about, um, about genocide, about the fact that they're still finding unmarked graves of children uh, adjacent to residential schools. I have these stories in my own, my own village, um, children missing from, um, from the records. Uh, we heard this summer news stories, and there may be more coming. Uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's work continues. We're pressing for them to have another year at least so that they can continue to unfurl and get the records from the federal government to tell the full story about what's happened. So we need to let that work continue. But I think it's a, it's a critical debate for us to be having. And I think for our, our young people to understand uh, the important reflections about this issue of genocide and other societies uh, and peoples around the world and what happened to them um, and their experiences. I've related just a few about the civil rights movement. Um, and there are big differences. Um, we, we also want to see what's similar about these different events. Why? So that we can learn from them so that we can understand and we can have conversations across cultures, across races, across experiences, and support one another. And I think that's the value in, in, having, um, in having that debate or that discussion occur right now. I would say, though, that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, their work in, in helping to expose and uncover, needs to continue. The voices of survivors needs to be fully heard, which it has not yet. This summer, uh, the country learned about uh, nutrition experiments done on people. My dad told me about this over the dinner table. Why is it that a, another child at the age of eight would get oranges and he wouldn't get oranges? It now became clear what was going on. We didn't know. We didn't, he didn't understand it. How can you ask an eight-year-old, right, to understand that somebody's getting good food and somebody else isn't getting good food? This is why I continue to be amazed at the resilience of people like my dad and his generation who've overcome such incredible odds to to achieve what they have, um, despite uh, uh, incredible oppression that our people have faced. So that's my feeling on it and at this moment, is that there's more discussion to be had. The TRC's work needs to continue, uh, but an important debate that needs to involve all of us. 
Hi, um, my name is Monique Fry, and I'm from the Chan Band of the Stalo Nation uh, in BC, but I live here in Calgary. Don't ask why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, but I'm, um, I'm also a master's student at the University of Calgary in communication and culture, and one of the things that I'm constantly striving for is the use of Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous research methodologies um, and theories and stuff like that, and just having to really push those boundaries. I'm the only Indigenous person in my faculty, and so I'm going sort of outside the faculty to find the support and the help. And um, But that being said, U of C is being very flexible with me and allowing me that opportunity. So um, my other hat, I am a, a community liaison with the Calgary Urban Aboriginal Initiative, which is a UAS-funded um, project. And I just wanted to know sort of your input on the support that AFN gives to the UAS and to urban strategies, because we're very successful in Calgary, and we have been for since 1999. So I just wanted to know... What is your response to sort of the urban stuff that's going on? I, I was in uh, the Stalo territories, your territories, uh, just the other day or last week. And so regards from home, as with uh, Chief and GM. Um, well, I'm a part-time uh, Eastman, part-time res kid, moved, lived on three reserves, uh, moved around a lot because Dad took us to the city. And um, I remember uh, um, my wife Nancy and our family and I uh, we remember doing work to try to 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 try to uh, close the gap of disconnection between sort of on and off reserve. Uh, we tried to get a house in our village for 30 years, but there's not enough room, not enough homes. Wasn't always being in the city because we we chose to or wanted to. And the stories are so different because the 60s scoop. You know, we met because of the work we did in establishing urban programming in Vancouver. Uh, we met a young person who came into our office, and I said, I know that person. They look familiar to me. And my staff said, no, you've never met that person. Um, they say they come from, they were, were born and raised in California. They're here in Canada. This is their first day. He says he comes from the Williams family from a house it, and he wants to know where that is. That's our story. It's absolutely astounding. The 60s scoop is part of the reality of the history as well. I've talked about the residential schools. So our people end up in the urban settings, and we as Indigenous peoples are often told, well, you need to move from your reserve to the city because that's where the action's at. Or our people are in the city for their own reasons, either difficulties at home or disconnections or for work. Or they've ended up, you know, being adopted out and they're looking to find that identity in the, the urban organizations that have sprung up across the country, like the Friendship Center, probably kept me out of jail and probably kept me from being six feet under because I was teaching breakdancing to other kids. I was a purpose there. <laughs> An indoor soccer. And there were people there that were also First Nations. Some were New Chonalth as well. So you see, this is part of the unpacking piece that is going on in this country. The effort of, of nation building very often will have to do with just seeing somebody who looks like you, who's got a similar story and a background like you. And then for some, it goes further. It says, well, I am Anishinaabe, I'm Mi'kmaq, I am Dene, I am uh, New Chonalth, and I want to know where I come from and who my people are. And so the urban organizations that have spread up across the country, uh, very often there's also been fights uh, that have been perpetrated about funding. Who's going to get the funding? Is it the Assembly of First Nations, the Chief and Council? Is it going to be the urban organization? Well, everybody needs the support right now because of this, this work to rebuild family and community and identity, reconnect with language and culture and teachings. And you see these places in the urban settings are like havens. And for me, it was literally perhaps the difference between standing here um, in front of you and, and taking a path where I don't find the opportunity to find my own potential. So um, I know I work closely with national or at the national level with the Friendship Center movement. We work with, uh, we have connections with the Inuit and the Métis National Associations, with the Native Women's Association of Canada, and we end up in meetings with the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples. We're often told that we've got to fight because, well, some are status, non-status, somebody represents me, somebody else doesn't represent me. And what I saw, the indigenous peoples, young people for the last year, and I don't know more, I saw them saying, guys, we got to figure out a way to work together. We have to find a way through this. We didn't create the Indian Act that created status, non-status, on, off, reserve. Those who grew up with their language, those who didn't. It was thrust on us. And so that's how I feel about it. I feel deeply about it. We also created a lower mainland New Channel organization in Vancouver. And my son is the very first sitting Vancouver um, elected council member for our village of Ahousit. So you see, there are, there, there are ways being found. So my son lives in East Van. 
just like his dad did. But he's on chief and counsel, which I didn't necessarily encourage. But he said that he wanted to contribute. So he's working on chief and counsel. He commutes to our village of Ahausen on the West Coast, but he also lives in the city. So he's got the ability to bridge the gap and make sure that when we go food fishing, that they send a truck of fish, salmon in the summertime so that it's brought to the city so that the Nuchano people get a taste of home, home squared, the home that they, for, other, for many reasons they've not been able to be connected to. So I just wanted to share that thought about what you're asking, but I wanted to share with the society and with the patrons that this is a big project that we're, we're, we're attempting to undertake right now of reconnecting family and, and community and identity. And so I feel strongly about supporting the work that goes on in the urban settings. Maybe one more question, I think. Um, Chief Atlio, thank you very much for joining us today. It's uh, been a really inspirational talk. Um, my name's David Torrey. I'm from the University of Calgary. I'm sorry if we've sort of dominated the mic. There were a few questions, I suppose. But uh, my question to you is, is there a way for, in, in terms of a, a new social contract from a socioeconomic standpoint, there are a lot of obvious uh, bread and butter issues and inequality issues between the Aboriginal peoples of Canada and the rest of the country. I'm curious, is there a better or a, a new way forward in terms of intergovernmental relations to uh, assuage some of these uh, more acute issues when we talk about clean drinking water, lack of housing, the sort of issues that need uh, immediate solutions. Is there a better way for bound councils and for Aboriginal governments to interact with the federal government and vice versa to improve uh, the transfer and assistance needed in those regions? Yes. <laughs> Perhaps your thoughts on a way forward. <laughs> the, the UN Declaration provides a great framework. Um, it's a contemporary articulation that I've, I understand that the vast majority of, of treaty leaders as well uh, stand behind and, and support that offers uh, really a framework or an agenda or a way forward. And I can give you some tangible policy examples. It says that in areas like education, First Nations have the right to design an education system that works for themselves. First Nations uh, desire, as we have for 40 plus years, First Nations control of First Nations education. We have education as a national priority right now. The federal government uh, proposes, by and large unilaterally, uh, an education act that uh, so far misses the mark um, as to overstep the principle that the UN Declaration, that the treaties, the Constitution, the Royal Proclamation suggests. I suggest that Canadians support us to push the federal government as the principal uh, link to First Nations, because that's where the relationship currently sits, is to respect and work with First Nations to see those treaties implemented because they belong to you as well. And the, the, the potential of, of the young people in First Nations uh, depends on getting this right. And not to be asked to choose between a policy or a practical. Well, here's the practical uh, example. So let's just do this program over here. Just put those rights aside because those are from the past. Uh, the Declaration and over 100 Thailand right court cases um, affirm that our rights exist in this country. And it's a false choice to, to, to be asked to decide between your rights or a program stream. The best example came together recently. Here's something real tangible. Right in Treaty 7 territories, when the floods hit. Like the Philippines, people, we just, we see barriers melt and humans come together. And when I was there and the flooding started to occur, you could feel it happening. In the hotel room where I was staying, there was a sense of camaraderie amongst the people. People were helping one another, another out. I had three trips all together in that time frame. And in those three trips, supporting the, the Treaty 7 chiefs, because that's my role, reaching out to federal and provincial uh, ministers, because that's my job, is to advocate when asked for. You have communities that were deeply in need in the moment. I sat in meetings where there were three provincial ministers, three federal ministers, and the chiefs represented. There was no interjurisdictional issue in that moment. One of the elders from Treaty 7 said, as the plan was being discussed and the action was being moved on immediately, without any delay or bureaucracy or red tape or going to the Indian Act and looking up what page you could do, people just moved. The Treaty 7 elder said in that moment, this is treaty making when people are in need. Just cutting through all of it. <laughs> You're so absolutely right. What's been holding us back from acting on the fact that we have a crisis right now. 
We have human rights organizations, both domestically and internationally, saying that there's a human rights crisis in Canada with First Nations right now in 2013. We have every ability to do this and to move as rapidly and as quickly as I saw in the Treaty 7 flood issue and have the jurisdictions come together and recognize the First Nations governments and sit with them to establish a way forward that will work for them. What's been holding us back? Well, we've been talking about this since the days of Trudeau, talking about being an Indian problem. And what I'm encouraging here today is that we transform this into First Nations Canada potential and the potential of of these young people. When we stop thinking about this as a problem, when we overcome the fear of the other, that somehow the chiefs in 1910, when they were saying we should share equally, that we will all be prosperous, that healthy, prosperous First Nations in Alberta, in Treaty 7, in Canada, will make a healthier and more prosperous Canada. Then, with great confidence, we can turn our efforts around the world and be a true champion of human rights. Thank you.